so what I want to do briefly is to use the example of Ascension Island, which I published on some years ago, uh, to illustrate some of the ideas about using trees. Um, but I've said here, uh, this Ascension Island example is in many ways actually uh, an example of almost the perfect scenario for trying to sequester carbon uh, with afforestation. So a more general point that I'll try and make briefly is some of the problems and complications that you may need to actually have to think about. So this uh, diagram here, I pinched from a, a paper by Lenton and Vaughan from a few years ago. And what it tries to do in one diagram is summarize the various ways in which you can potentially do something from an engineering point of view, what's often called geoengineering, to actually do something about climate change, about global warming. And at its simplest on here, there are broadly two approaches. One of which is to try and do something about the temperature in a sort of engineering sort of way by bringing the temperature down, the high-tech versions of things like sunscreens in space, which reduce the amount of solar radiation hitting the Earth. The other approach on here is actually to take the CO2 and take the CO2 out of the atmosphere. And there are ways of doing this which are straight engineering or uh, uh, chemistry. I'm a biologist. I tend to focus on uh, ways of doing this that actually uses biology to do it. And that's where it uh, sort of overlaps with the sorts of things that uh, Greg is thinking about, uh, because clearly one way of taking CO2 out of the atmosphere is through afforestation. And again, just very briefly to make uh, a more general point in passing, I am deeply, deeply nervous about approaches to geoengineering that are really just about reducing temperature, sunscreens in space, playing with clouds or whatever, because that does nothing about CO2 levels in the atmosphere. And one of the additional problems with CO2 in the atmosphere is making oceans more acidic. And we really have a very poor understanding of the potential implications of this at the moment. It may be a huge problem, it may be a minor problem, but certainly until we know whether it's a minor problem or a huge problem, I wouldn't like to be going around making the oceans more acidic. So I, I don't like the, just the sunscreen type approaches. Uh, the idea of taking CO2 out of the atmosphere seems to me far more sensible. So to go back to sort of high school biology and photosynthesis, you know, think of a tree trunk. Trees aren't made of air. This sounds ridiculous to, to you know, you wander into uh, uh, a bar uh, or a nice old-fashioned pub, there's one or two down the road, bang the wooden table uh, uh, at the bar and say, your bar is made of air, they're likely not to serve you because they think you're intoxicated. But actually that is what photosynthesis means, CO2 from the atmosphere is the main raw ingredient of making trees. So if you grow trees, you are taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. So if you increase the number of trees, you reduce the amount of CO2. Clearly, this is a thing that worked on a time scale of 100 years or so, because eventually you'll run out of space to put more trees. But on that sort of 100 years sort of time scale, growing more trees may be quite a sensible way of doing something about uh, CO2 levels. It's not, though, the case that trees are always good, and this is a more general point that I'd like to make in passing, because vegetation does more than just lock up CO2. It affects what the uh, Earth looks like from space, and therefore it affects the amount of solar radiation reflected back into space. And this is the most spectacular at uh, higher latitudes than Greg's project is interested in. He's interested in sort of North African deserts and the like, bits of Spain, but if you move to the Arctic, or, uh, you see the problem much more dramatically. You look at uh, a slide like this, and spruce forest, it's actually uh, alpine spruce forest in the middle of the alpine winter, where there are dark trees, the land is dark and is absorbing solar radiation. Where there's lying snow away from the dark trees, it's actually reflecting lots of radiation back into space. So actually by altering the amount of reflection uh, uh, with vegetation, trees can sometimes, under some situations, actually make the matter worse from the point of view of uh, temperature of the planet. And that's at its, at its most serious at very high latitudes, where you have long periods of the year with lying snow. Least serious in the tropics, put trees in the tropics, and nearly always you will be actually doing something that is positive in the point of view of global warming. And when you come to latitude of Britain, uh, um, you're sort of in between the two. The effect will probably not be as great as in the tropics, uh, but not as uh, seriously the other way as potentially it can be uh, at very high uh, latitudes. Not directly relevant to uh, perhaps to. Um, um, looking at deserts, except of course some desert sediments are really quite light coloured. So again, if you're trying to work out the effects of vegetating bits of desert, you may need to think about the albedo, the reflectance of desert surfaces. And again, that's another reason where uh, ascension, which we're going to come on to, is sort of the best case. Ascension is, is here, uh, in the uh, uh, tropical South Atlantic, and much of it looks like that. It's a volcanic island of dark volcanic sediment. 
So we don't really have an albedo problem here. Put vegetation on that and you're not uh, uh, making a light of sediment look darker, uh, so you don't have these complications. It's one of the ways in which ascension is a, is a best case scenario. So most of ascension is rather dry, although over the last few years, it's become, even at these lower uh, uh, altitudes, but down by the coast, it's becoming damper. Whether that's a blip or a long-term process, no one's uh, at all sure. But if you go to higher parts of ascension, up onto Green Mountain, which give you a sense of scale, is roughly the sort of size of uh, you know, your typical Lake District fell, then there is more rainfall and more vegetation. Now there is forest, but this is an unnatural forest. And when Darwin visited, and um, these extracts have been taken from uh, Darwin's diary, uh, he calls it Green Hill rather than the current Green Mountain. He said the name is taken from the faintest tinge of that colour, which at times is barely perceptible from the anchorage. So it's sort of slightly green. Actually, if you went up there in Darwin's time, and Darwin did, he walked to the top. Uh, it's quite warm there. Uh, Darwin was really rather, you know, you think of Darwin as the older invalid. He was stunningly fit at the time. This was towards the end of his trip around the world, uh, and uh, certainly to hike from sea level in those temperatures up to the top in a day, which Darwin did uh, suggest that he was pretty fit at the time. He also said the island was destitute of trees. Not strictly true. There was one small shrub, which was probably always rare, and Darwin never saw it, but no extensive forest. Trees never got there. Ascension is geologically recent, only about a million years old. It's a long, long way from anywhere, and trees just hadn't really arrived on Ascension Island. Compare that with Ascension now. That's the summit of Green Mountain now. Uh, bamboo forest, uh, ferns, go down Green Mountain a little bit and you have lots of trees. It's now, the best description I can come up with it is uh, a, a cloud <coughs> forest. And all of these trees have been introduced by people. And indeed, you know, standing, the, almost the best place to talk about this sort of thing is uh, in the Palace of Westminster. I've talked about Ascension in various places, but this is the best. It is an imperial British fault, if you like, that this is covered with trees. Uh, we imported them all. Uh, once we stuck uh, Napoleon on uh, St. Helena, um, someone said, well, where, where would you base a rescue mission? The answer is Ascension. So he stuck a load of Marines on Ascension, just in case anyone wanted to rescue Napoleon. And it was a really awful place. Um, you, there, was, there was little vegetation, uh, little fresh water, uh, difficult to grow any fresh food, no, no women either, which probably didn't you know, enamor it to the Marines. Uh, and so the Admiralty actually said, well, what should we do to make Ascension better? And the answer from scientists at the time, uh, such as people like, uh, particularly actually, uh, Darwin's close friend, Junior colleague uh, uh, Hooker was trees. You want trees, put in trees and you'll get more rainfall. Put in trees, you'll get better soil, you'll be able to grow more vegetation, including food, uh, and you can make the place nice. And they did that uh, on Green Mountain and they were spectacularly successful. Again, Green Mountain is a perfect example of you know, everything playing in the right direction. Uh, along the bottom of that slide there, there's a sort of little diagram showing what happens with an oceanic island with clouds blowing over. Ascension is in the full force of the trade winds. A very low-lying uh, uh, island, the clouds just whiz across the top, no rain, and stays arid. Very, very tall one, you get a sort of cloud belt halfway up your mountain, bits of Tenerife and things are a bit like that. And Ascension is pretty much this middle uh, uh, situation here, where it's just tied off with the clouds sit on the top. And you can see that happening in this photograph here. That bamboo cloud forest I was showing you is, is up in those clouds. Um, and you get lots of rainfall. And much of the rainfall that's actually coming in is probably what best thought of as a cold precipitation, as the term meteorologists often use. It's the clouds blowing in and water drops precipitating out on the vegetation and then dropping onto the soil. So effectively, by making the thing more three-dimensional with trees and bamboo, then more water, more mist settles out on the vegetation and drips down, and you get a wetter system and, and more vegetation. So again, if you've got a situation like this, then if you put in trees, you'll get more rainfall and potentially make things um, self-sustaining. Clearly, not all coastal situations are uh, going to work like that. So again, there's a big problem for climatologists in trying to find the right sort of sites where if you stick vegetation on a coast, which might be now relatively arid, you're going to get enough mist coming in, settling out, uh, uh, that you eventually won't need irrigation and the thing will grow. So again, there are interesting questions for the OASIS program in just how many sites are there uh, where this will actually work. And it's certainly something that needs uh, further work on. But in principle, you know, it does work on occasions, and in principle it may work in a variety <coughs> of different places.
The last point I just want to make to finish off is we're talking largely about trees, but actually don't ignore the soils. Um, those are some uh, um, uh, measurements of the amount of carbon uh, in, in soils on ascension. Uh, lots and lots of carbon locked up in the soils uh, in the uh, Green Mountain where the vegetation is. Very little in the, in the arid places. Um, in truth, before the forest, it was still a sort of wet, damp, fern-covered mountain, and there would have been quite a bit of carbon in the soil. But I want to leave you just with one thing. Car soils matter when it comes to sequestering carbon. Visualise your favourite, you know, English deciduous woodland. Wander into it in your mind's eye and ask yourself where most of the carbon is. It's not in the trees. For the few woods where people are measured in detail, there is far more carbon locked up in soils than there is locked up in the trees. And again, that's one last complication I want to leave you with. On some situations, you may, by planting trees, Yes, lock more carbon in the trees, but deplete carbon in soils. And again, in some situations, there may be a fine balance as to whether you're doing more good with the trees or not. Ascension, again, a best case scenario, it seems you know, no problem that uh, uh, by growing this vegetation, uh, we actually have locked up more carbon there. But again, some, for example, there are some grassland soils that have a lot of carbon in, put on trees, you need to actually study in some detail to know actually whether you're losing more carbon uh, than you're locking up. And the worst case scenarios are putting trees on peatlands where uh, very often you may be actually losing more carbon on a long time scale, not on a short time scale, but on a long time scale than you're, you're locking up. So there are complications. Trees are not always good, but very often they're good. And the nearer the tropics you go, uh, then the more likely you are to actually be having a major effect in locking up uh, CO2. They can't solve everything. Do the sums and you can't get rid of all the CO2 into trees, but you can take things in the right direction.